Peru's cabinet of ministers, led by Aníbal Torres, received a vote of confidence from the Peruvian Congress on Wednesday. Russia ratified the entry into force of a new humanitarian truce in Ukraine to allow the evacuation of civilians from the capital Kyiv and other cities. In South Korea, election authorities announced as virtual winner the opposition candidate Yoon Suk-yeol of the People's Power Party. Hello, welcome to From the South. My name is Gladys Marlenis Quesada Cruz. I'm your anchor from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. And now we begin this news brief. Peru's cabinet of ministers, led by Aníbal Torres, received a vote of confidence from the Peruvian Congress on Wednesday. After more than nine hours of session, the ministerial cabinet was finally approved with 64 votes in favor, 58 against, and two abstentions. The head of the cabinet explained to the parliamentarians the work being carried out by the government of President Pedro Castillo after seven months since he took office. Finally, he called for a political agreement as a way to achieve the democratic governance that the people of Peru need. Among the issues discussed by Torres were the paralyzed works, health care, as well as public services. Venezuela and the United States have confirmed that a bilateral meeting did take place in an unprecedented move given the pressures exerted by the U.S. in recent years. Let's examine the reactions from Caracas. It was announced by the media and later confirmed by the parties involved. Delegates from the United States did travel to Caracas to meet with Venezuelan delegation headed by President Nicolás Maduro himself. The main issues on the table were the ongoing political dialogue and oil production. The meeting, which lasted for over two hours, took place in the Miraflores Government Palace. We had a respectful, cordial and very diplomatic meeting. The purpose of the treat by administration officials was to discuss a number of issues, which of course included energy security, but also the health and well-being of detained U.S. citizens. One immediate result of the meeting was announced by President Maduro himself, the reactivation of a national dialogue. The talks held in Mexico were very important, but since we are asking that world conflicts be resolved through dialogue, we must set an example. We need to reformat the national dialogue process. It needs to be more inclusive, more comprehensive in every sense. With this move, the United States has definitely taken out the game those sectors of the opposition which favor an armed intervention and the isolation of the Venezuelan government. For the most part, these sectors are still silent. Only a few opinion makers have spoken through social media. U.S. Republican Senator Marco Rubio, a constant agitator against Venezuela, is not hiding his annoyance, though. This is betrayal that those who have been opposing Maduro, those who have marched in the streets, those who have sacrificed themselves, who have lost so much fighting Maduro, and now he makes this arrangement without notifying the opposition. It's shameful. Those sectors of the opposition who decided to get involved in the electoral process do value this rapprochement. El dialogo. Dialogue first and foremost to solve the issues that impact the lives of Venezuelans, like the sanctions and the blockade, and also those moves made by fellow citizens who have appropriated assets of a na nation, thus inflicting harm to the Venezuelan people. This is a turning point in the relationship between the two countries, despite all the pressure exerted by the United States in recent years. Now they have de facto acknowledged the Venezuelan government headed by Maduro, contrary to their mindset a year or a week ago. We certainly don't expect any direct contact with Maduro anytime soon. Again, our focus is working with our allies and partners. We must understand the situation in the right diplomatic scope what this represents for the Americans, that they are retracting from their previous foreign policy, which ignore the Venezuelan authorities, a policy that has put the Venezuelan economy under siege. For analysts, this is a reflection of the global readjustment of the geopolitical forces in conflict, and Venezuela has a few moves to make in this chess game. 
it, it's all very subjected to elusive and bivalent positions of non-compliance by the United States because their foreign policy is one of the seat and it should be understood in those terms. Definitive dismantling of the sanctions against Venezuela will not be taking place anytime soon. But there may be a de facto non-enforcement and some exceptional provision issued for the purchase of crude oil from Venezuela and some other limited transactions with Venezuela. The government and the Venezuelan people have sought dialogue while enduring the consequences of a blockade and time has proved them right. Leonel Retamal, Telesur, Caracas, Venezuela. And also concerning International Women's Day, this March 8th, Brazilian women took to the streets to protest against Bolsonaro's genocidal policies, rejected sexual violence and demanded gender equality. Our correspondent, Brian Mir, with the details. On March 8th, tens of thousands of women took to the streets in dozens of cities across Brazil to commemorate International Women's Day, which was first declared a holiday by the Russian Soviet Republic in 1917 and declared an international holiday by the UN in 1977. The main reason we are occupying the streets all over Brazil on this March 8th is to denounce the negative effects of agribusiness in our life and most of all the damage that President Bolsonaro has caused to Brazil, which directly affects the lives of women. In Recife, the women from the social movements and labor unions which organized the march highlighted the erosion of rights and increase in femicide caused by the last three years of Jair Bolsonaro's disastrous far-right government. The Pernambuco Education Workers' Union is on the street protesting Bolsonarism, this genocidal government that has caused the death of thousands of women. It is an anti-science, anti-education and anti-women government. On March 8th, the streets of cities across Brazil echoed with shouts of Out with Bolsonaro. Brian Mir, Telesur, Recife. Thank you, Brian, for this report, and now we move on to other topics. Guatemala's Congress passed a bill that toughens abortion criminalization and rejects the rights and existence of sexual diversities. After a third debate session, the lawmakers approved the so-called Law for the Protection of Life and Family. The law establishes penalties of between 5 and 50 years in prison against abortion in any of its circumstances, including voluntary involuntary abortions. I beg your pardon. In turn, the law restricts equal marriage while prohibiting the teaching and learning of sexual education, as well as the display of or explanation of any sexual orientation other than heterosexuality in all educational institutions in the nation. Social movements rejected the initiative, which they claim increases state persecution against vulnerable sectors in the Central American nation and violates the rights of non-patriarchal and non-heterosexual minorities. In Chile, the exciting government of Sebastián Piñera extends the state of emergency in the southern macro zone. The Chilean Senate extended for 15 days the state of emergency that has been enforced in the southern macro zone since last October. This new deployment of militarization will be extended until the 26th of this month. The measure affects Mapuche territories in the provinces of Biobío, Arauco, Cautín and Mayeco. And for this reason, the Mapuche community has denounced police harassment and repression on several occasions. The measure comes into force during the first 15 days of the government of President-elect Gabriel Boric, who will have the power to annul it. Interior Minister Rodrigo Delgado said that this is the last declaration under Sebastián Piñera's government, and it will be up to Boric and the future Under Secretary of the Interior to decide whether to maintain this condition. And now we move on to other topics. Colombians voting abroad in the legislative elections is running smoothly. The announcement was made by, on Tuesday by the nation's foreign minister, who also said that at least 6,000 Colombians have already voted at the 250 polling stations in 67 countries set up by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the National Registry. Another 106 stations will be added by next Sunday. Polls abroad opened on March the 6th and will close on March 13th. The day is scheduled for the country's legislative voting and for the coalition's consultations for the coming presidential elections.
We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. More news now. Russia ratifies the entry into force of a new humanitarian truce in Ukraine to allow the evacuation of civilians from the capital Kiev and other cities. Today, the Russian Interdepartmental Coordinating Body for Humanitarian Response in Ukraine announced that the ceasefire started this Wednesday at 7 a.m. Ukrainian time is aimed at guaranteeing security and facilitating the work of humanitarian corridors. During this ceasefire, Moscow has proposed to establish continuous communication between the Russian and the Ukrainian sides to exchange information on the process. Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Irina Voroshuk confirmed the setup of new humanitarian corridors in several cities to evacuate the civilian population. The Russian Defense Ministry posted a video of humanitarian aid being distributed among the residents of a village outside of the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. The ministry stated that Russian servicemen delivered food supplies and articles of daily necessity to the Izum district of Kharkiv, the region to provide the locals with humanitarian aid. The aid and assistance was delivered to the areas controlled by the Russian Federation Armed Forces and liberated from the presence of Ukrainian nationalists. And this Wednesday, Russian authorities have denounced the economic war imposed by the United States. Russian presidential spokesperson Dmitry Peskov warned that the United States is waging an economic war against Russia. Peskov said that the Russian government is implementing systemic measures to stabilize the country's economic situation. These statements follow the White House announcement of an embargo on oil and gas imports from Russia, also the latest sanction imposed by Washington against Moscow because of its crisis in Ukraine. On Wednesday, China condemned the U.S. ban on oil imports from Russia over the conflict with Ukraine, while stressing that any unilateral sanction has no basis in international law. At a press conference, Sao Lijian, the foreign ministry's spokesperson, denounced that the policy of imposing restrictions under any pretext will not contribute to peace and security. He also warned that punitive measures harm the economy and the lives of the peoples. It only causes losses and aggravates divisions and clashes. He defended the cooperative ties between China and Russia in the energy sector and stressed that regardless of the situation, they will continue their exchanges under the principles of respect, equality and mutual benefit. He confirmed the shipment of the first batch of humanitarian aid to Ukraine, valued at almost $791,000 and consisted of food and basic goods. On the other hand, U.S. threatens Beijing with reprisals if it keeps trade with Russia. Washington warns shipmakers not to export semiconductors to Russia. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo warned in an interview with the New York Times that if Chinese technology companies violate U.S. sanctions and continue exporting semiconductors to Russia and Belarus, they could retaliate by cutting off critical supplies to these countries. Basically, we could shoot down SMIZ, the world's largest Chinese semiconductor company, with offices in the United States, Japan and Italy, because we, the United States, stopped them from using our equipment and our software. Raimondo said, referring to Chinese companies that continue to work with their Russian counterparts. And Russia underscores that Moscow's troops are not working to topple the Ukrainian government. The goals of the special military operation are the protection of the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, the elimination of the military threat against Russia, which comes from Ukrainian territory due to NATO countries conquering it and pumping weapons into it. Its aim is not to occupy Ukraine or the destruction of its statehood or the overthrow of the government. It is not directed against the civilian population. 
And the Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zaharova says that negotiations with Kiev to resolve the Ukraine conflict are making headway. In parallel with the special military operation, negotiations are also being held with the Ukrainian side in order to end the senseless bloodshed and resistance of the armed forces of Ukraine as soon as possible. On March 7, as you already know, the third round of those talks was held in Belarus, during which political, military and humanitarian issues were discussed. Some progress has been made. In Denmark, Prime Minister apologizes to person to six Greenlandic Inuits removed from their families as part of an experiment. Danish Prime Minister apologized to six Greenlandic Inuits removed from their families and taken to Copenhagen more than 70 years ago as part of an experiment to create a Danish-speaking elite. At a ceremony, Prime Minister Met Frederiksen expressed it was terrible and inhumane that they went through. She also stated that the authorities must take responsibility and to do the only thing that is fair, to say sorry to them. In the summer of 1951, 22 Inuit children between the ages of 5 and 8 were sent to Denmark. The parents had been promised their children would have a better life, learn Danish and return to Greenland one day as the future lead. The children were not allowed to have any contact with their own families. After two years, 16 of the group were sent home to Greenland but placed in an orphanage. The others were adopted by Danish families. Several of the children never saw their real families again. And we have more news coming up after a final short break. So stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. In South Korea, election authorities announced as virtual winner the opposition candidate Jun Suk-kyo of the People's Power Party. According to the election authorities, Yoon Suk-yo has a slight lead with a 48.4% of the votes, while the Progressive Party candidate Lee Jae-myun has 47.8% support. With these results, it is estimated that the opposition presidential hopeful could become the next president of South Korea. Analysts also reported that Yoon voters have played a key role in determining the outcome of the election. The final results is expected to be announced in the early hours of Thursday and thus known the successor of Moon Jae-in, who was forbidden by the Constitution to seek re-election. South Korean citizens, wherever you are, are citizens of the same country, and you all deserve to be fairly treated. And we keep in mind that we are all one people and prioritize uniting South Korean citizens. Now we move on to other topics. On Wednesday, a Palestinian young man was killed after being repeatedly shot at by Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank. Palestinian adolescent Jemen Nafez Difal was killed in the city of Nablus by Israeli troops who not only fired at him but prevented an ambulance from reaching the young man as he lay on the ground bleeding. The Palestinian Islamic resistance movement, Hamas, has condemned this incident and labeled it as a war crime, saying the occupied forces are behaving like terrorists and they vow to continue their fight against the occupation regime. Tunisian President Kai Sayed declared a war on Wednesday on food speculators amid a shortage of products such as wheat and semolina, they staples, a key staples, I beg your pardon, in a country already mirrored in a political economic crisis. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has threatened supplies of basic food supplies, particularly wheat, with many Arab countries' imports from the two Eastern European nations. Sayed announced that he was launching a relentless war on speculators and criminals, accusing them of seeking to strike at social peace and security. Tunisia remains embroiled in an economic and political crisis eight months after Zayed seized extraordinary powers. Russia's invasion of Ukraine poses a threat to food supplies to Tunisia, which imports about half its width from Ukraine and is dependent on foreign countries for much of its food supplies. I want it to be a relentless war against these criminal speculators, with the framework of the law, of course, and we will handle it within the law. And there will be a decree connected to the issue of hunger, so that it becomes an issue of distribution within the framework of the law. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. 
And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, my name is Gladys Marlenis Quesada Cruz. Thank you for watching.